Hello and welcome back to our channel. I'm Colleen and this is Our Blessed Life. And today we're gonna to talk about how to use the good and the beautiful history for high school. Welcome to our channel. My name is Colleen and on our channel, we do family vlogs from a homeschool perspective. We also do homemaking content. We have adoption content as well as special needs. So if that sounds like content that you're interested in, go ahead and hit the subscribe button below and click the notification bell so that you will be notified every time we upload a new video. So I am making this video because I've had several of you ask, how can I use the good and the beautiful for high school? What do I need to do for credits and things like that? And, and when I was looking at the Good and the Beautiful History program, I had the same questions. I did the Google searches, I looked on the Facebook groups, and I really found very little information. So what you're gonna get today is purely my opinion. I have several different ideas on how you can do it. So today I'm gonna be sharing with you the pros and cons of using the Good and the Beautiful for high school, as well as four ways that you can incorporate it into your high school program if you choose to do so. Okay, first things first. I always like to start with the end in mind, and with high school that is super important because our goal is high school graduation and for some kids, college admission. So we wanna make sure that whatever we do for um, high school graduation, all the credits that we do, that they work for high school, and if you're working towards college admission, that it also works for that as well. So let's talk about what's required in most states and what most colleges are looking for, and it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so most states require for high school graduation one credit of American history, one credit of world history, um, one semester or a half credit of government, and um, a half credit of economics. Some states also want to see geography, and some states also require a state-specific um, history, like uh, the history of South Carolina or whatever. Our state doesn't actually require that, but some states do. So the first thing that I would recommend doing before you embark on any high school planning, um, including what we're talking about today, is I would look and see what your state requires. If your state does not have specific requirements for homeschooling, then I would go to a few of the state colleges and um, at least go, at least look at two and look at what their re admission requirements are. And you may find that they, um, like for example, some don't require world history, but they, um, but it's preferred, that kind of thing. So I would go ahead and make a list of what credits you need to get. Like I said, the ones I mentioned are the most common. Before we talk about the pros and cons of the Good and the Beautiful History curriculum and how to use it for high school, first let's talk about how it's laid out. The Good and the Beautiful History is laid out into four years, um, so four separate books. The way it works is different than some history programs because it's not like one whole book is American history, one whole book is world history like that. Instead, what it does is it covers four time periods in each book, each history year, and then in the next history year, it's going to come back and cover the same time periods, but it's going to cover different things in that time period. So in addition to the book, the course book, you also have some other materials that are intended to be used together to form the whole course. So the first thing would be either a big book of history stories, which comes with, with history year one and three, or a book of maps and images, which comes with history year two and four. You also have a timeline, which comes with year two, and timeline stickers for um, the various different years. Also, each um, year of history comes with a uh, specific game for that year that is um, allows the kids to review the material that they've learned. And also, for every unit, and there's four units in each book, um, it's meant to have a history read aloud. There are some suggestions at the front of the book based on different grade levels and um, so you would have four read alouds for each history year and then also each student would have their own student explorer um, which is kind of like their independent work to use along with the good and the beautiful history and they do have middle school and high school level history explorers so year one for instance covers ancient egypt the middle ages and the risk and the renaissance it covers the french and indian war through the revolutionary war and the victorian era the history of flight and the cold war then history year two covers ancient Greece and ancient Asia, the Vikings, exploration, and pre-Columbian America, 
And then in Unit 3, Colonial America and the U.S. Constitution. Unit 4 covers the Victorian era, the history of flight, and the Cold War era. Year 3 covers ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Israel. Unit 2 covers ancient Africa and native North Americans. Unit 3 covers westward expansion and industrial, industrialization. Unit 4 covers World War II. And then in history, year 4, Unit 1 covers ancient Rome, Christianity in the Middle Ages, and the history of Islam. Unit 2 covers the Reformation, the history of the Bible. Unit 3 covers slavery and the Civil War era, and then Unit 4 covers post-World War II history. Now, the Unit Explorers, they have additional articles to read, and they have additional projects to do, sometimes videos to watch, sometimes books to read. So it kind of makes it a more comprehensive course, especially for older kids. So the when you do your family read aloud from the book, it's going to be, um, it's not necessarily going to be on a high school level. So you're gonna read that to your kids, you're gonna do the read aloud, and then everybody's going to do their independent work in their History Explorer. So I wanna talk specifically about the grade 10 through 12 History Explorer, and um, I'm looking in the History Explorer for year one, just as an example, just to give you an idea of some of the projects and things that you will see. So, um, and this is from a sample that they have online, so you can go and look at this yourself. But this is, a, this is a sample from Unit 2, the projects that are listed. So, Project 1, read Alfred the Great by Jacob Abbott, and they link a website where you can go and read that for free. Project 2 is Alfred and the Great Personal Response Essay, and it gives you an opportunity to write a two-page personal response essay. Project three is reading selections from essentials in medieval history, and they also give you a link where you can access that book for free. Project four is a journal entry um, explaining the type of leader that you would like to be and how you will achieve your goal. Project five is on the Magna Carta, and it gives you different examples of, of assignments to do. Um, there's an article um, in, in the Student Explorer that the students should read, and then there's information on a couple of websites that they give you links to. And then it says, using that information, uh, write a two to three page informative essay on the Magna Carta, and it gives criteria for that. Um, and then project six is terms and summaries. So in your history notebook, in your own words, write a definition for the terms that are given. And then project seven is on John Locke. You're going to um, use the articles that are given to you and um, write a summary of that and share the information um, with, about John Locke with your parents. And then there's nonfiction reading and it says read the following chapters from Old World Background to Ameri American History by Samuel Bannister and it gives you the link for that and then it picks the chapters to read. So there's projects in the beginning and then there's articles um, throughout that unit for the student to read. So, and, that, and it's, gonna be that, it's gonna be that way for every single um, unit of every single year. Okay, so definitely there's high school level work within the Good and the Beautiful History. All right, so now, let's, now that we've talked about how the Good and the Beautiful History works, let's talk about the pros of using it for high school. So first of all, probably, probably the biggest pro would be that your high school student doesn't get left out when you do one of your family subjects. So many homeschoolers like to get their family together to do a family subject like science or history. And as kids get older and you still have younger kids, um, usually the older student will be left out because the, um, the subject matter that's being covered isn't really age appropriate or grade appropriate anymore for that student. Well, with the good and the beautiful and everyone having their own student explorers, now the high school students don't get left out and you can still cultivate that family time within your homeschool, um, which most homeschooling families want. So also many high school students enjoy the good and the beautiful history. I know my daughter Katie does enjoy it um, and she is entering 11th grade this year. Also the curriculum really is good and beautiful. It's a good curriculum. It's got beautiful pictures. Um, and it's it's just really really well done. It's creative. It's well laid out, and it, it's really 
in my opinion, it's one of the best history curriculum available. And there are, so from the homeschool mom's point of view, it is helpful to be able to combine everybody together to do one subject. And there are very, very few things that you can combine your elementary students and your high school students together um, to do. All right, so what are the cons of using the good and the beautiful for high school? The primary con would be that it isn't laid out in a way that easily allows you to take high school credits. So that's definitely a problem as far as high school graduation and college admission. So it, re it, it can still be done, but it does require some creativity and it requires some planning ahead. Also, there are no tests or quizzes with the Good and the Beautiful History, so it makes assessing uh, progress harder. Now, a lot of homeschool parents don't really care about assessing because as homeschool parents, we work side by side with our students. We really know what they know and what they don't know and what they've mastered and what they haven't mastered. But when it comes to high school, we do need grades because we need grades, we need a GPA, and all of that is a requirement for high school graduation and college admission. So even though we may not like it, it's still a fact of life that we do have to deal with. So we do need some means of assessment. Okay, so if you're here, you are probably very interested in using the good and the beautiful for high school and you wanna know how we can overcome these challenges. What can we do to overcome the cons that we just talked about, about the good and the beautiful for high school? So let's talk about credits first. So the bottom line really is that the good and the beautiful has enough credits for one credit of American history and one credit of world history if we combine all four years of the program. Um, so that's good news because it means we can use the Good and the Beautiful program, we can use the whole program, and we can still get one year of American history and one year of world history. Um, it will not give you a credit for government or economics, so you would need to add that on. Now, in order to achieve these credits, we may have to be a little bit creative. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you three ways that you can achieve these credits. And like I said, some of these ways will work better for some families and some will work better for other families. Now, like I said, we need to do all four books in order to get an American history and a um, world history. So a lot of times people will do an American history credit after doing year one and two and a world history credit after doing year three and four, primarily because there's more American history in the first two books and more world history in the second two books. Um, and at one point, The Good and the Beautiful actually stated that on their website. I don't know if it's still on there, but that was their advice at, at some point with these books. So how do we issue these credits? Well, the first way we could do it is by combining books in a single year. A ninth grade would be an American history year and you would do high school year one and two. Now that may, say, that may seem impossible to do a whole year or two whole years of history in one year, but it's really not that bad because the, um, first of all, there's only 60 lessons in each book. So you could do uh, year one in first semester and year two in second semester. I probably, if you're doing both books together, I would pick and choose the projects in the, in the high school explorer that pertain to American history. So in other words, things that even if they are world history, but they, are, they greatly relate to American history, such as the Magna Carta project, that would be a good one to pick. So you wouldn't pick every single thing to do. You may have them read the articles, but you would pick the projects in every, um, you know, in first semester, we'd be looking at high school year one. So we would pick the projects from unit you know, one, two, three, and four that relate the most to US history, and then do the same in second semester for year two. So that would be one way to do it. And if you did that in ninth grade, you would have a credit for American history, the good and the beautiful history year one and two. In 10th grade, you would issue a credit for um, world history and after completion of the good and the beautiful year three and four. And then in 11th grade, you could do government and in 12th grade, you could do economics and you would have all of your credits and you would have used the good and the beautiful. Some people do not wanna do it that way because um, they may also have kindergartners and younger elementary um, schoolers also in their family and they feel like if we are trying to do two history years in one year, that's too fast for my littles. Okay, so there's another way that you can do it. You would still have your high school student working with the rest of your family. You would do the good and the beautiful history year one in ninth grade and don't issue a credit do the Good and the Beautiful History Year 2 in 10th grade, and that year issue an American History credit. In 11th grade, do the Good and the Beautiful Year 3 and don't issue a credit. 
In 12th grade, do the good and the beautiful year four and issue a world history credit. Now, you would still need economics and government, so your high school student at, one po at some point would need to get those credits in, so they would end up doing American history and government or world history and economics is the way that would work out. Um, I think that's highly doable for a high school student, particularly because, um, again, each of those years only has 60 lessons, and most high school um, curriculum would have 120 to 180 lessons, so I think there's definitely time in there. Also, doing it this way gives you the ability to completely do all of the projects in the unit explorers rather than picking only the American projects for the ninth grade year and only the world history projects for the 10th grade year. A third idea would be instead of doing it where you have to overlap, you could just start earlier. So in most states, you can issue high school credits at least by eighth grade. In most states, it's even seventh grade. So the first thing you'll need to know is you'll need to find out when you can issue high school credits um, for high school work in middle school. Like I said, the answer is either going to be seventh grade or eighth grade, depending on your state. So you'll need to find that out first. But assuming that that is possible for you to do in your state, then we could alter our schedule and we could have our home family do in seventh grade. You could do year one, in eighth grade year two, and then issue a credit for American history in eighth grade. That still works for most states that are allowed to at least take high school credit by eighth grade. And then in ninth grade and 10th grade, do history year three and four and issue a uh, world history credit after um, 10th grade or at the end of 10th grade. And then in 11th grade, you can do government and in 12th grade, you could do economics and that gets all of your credits in and allows you to, to do all of the good and the beautiful history rather than combining years. So that's another way to do it is just start it sooner. An alternate idea that you can do if you just love the good and the beautiful history but you don't, necess you don't necessarily care about using it for credits, um, you can use another history program for the actual high school credit and just have your students sit in as like their morning time um, for the um, lessons that you're reading out of The Good and the Beautiful. And that's what I'm going to be doing this year. Last year, I actually used The Good and the Beautiful year one and two to make an American history year. And I'll go ahead and link to our 10th grade review up top. We did enjoy The Good and the Beautiful a lot. My daughter said she thought it was a little bit easy. And um, so that was really her only complaint. Um, I felt like it was a good bit of work to do it the way we did it, where we did first semester year one, second semester year two, and then picking and choosing the projects and all of that. So we decided this year we're going to use Masterbrook's World History. I'm going to make it an honors course by selecting um, certain um, projects that come from the student explorers in uh, the Good and the Beautiful year three and four, and then I'm going to just let her be included in our morning time where we will actually read the Good and the Beautiful year three this year, and then in her 12th grade year, our morning time will involve, part of our morning time will involve reading the Good and the Beautiful year four. So that's what we plan to do to finish out high school. So I will not be issuing credits on the basis of the Good and the Beautiful. Instead, I'll be issuing the World History credit on the basis of master books, but I'm still using the Good and the Beautiful, and we're doing it this way because that's what my daughter preferred. And um, last year when we did American History, at some point we really struggled with the assessment part. Um, so that was really our biggest challenge and we added Masterbooks American History at that point because they had tests and quizzes that I could use and obviously in order for her to be able to really do well on those tests and quizzes she needed to read that book. And when she did that, she really enjoyed it and wanted to incorporate it this year as well. All right, so let's talk about assessment now. And I've kind of um, just kind of started talking about that and just kind of telling you about our previous years. But there are no tests and quizzes in The Good and the Beautiful History, so we do need to find a way to, um, to grade. You could create your own tests and quizzes. Um, you will find if you go on The Good and the Beautiful Facebook group that no one has created tests and quizzes, or if they have, they have not uploaded them to the Facebook group, and the reason is copyright. Um, so if you're putting information directly from that, then you, you wouldn't be able to you know, share, share that with other people. 
but you could create your own tests and quizzes for your high school student. Um, if you did that, then you obviously would have a means of assessment that would solve your problem. You also have reading assignments and other projects. Um, you could give a grade for completion of reading assignments. Um, basically, either did it or you didn't do it. Um, you could do um, grades for the projects. There is no rubric um, in the Student Explorer, but it does tell you what you need to do. So you could assign points to the things that have to be done, creating your own rubric, and then you could grade those projects. So you could grade the projects and let that just be your, your assessment criteria just for the projects, or you could add tests and quizzes that you create yourself and also have grades from tests and quizzes. Um, you also could do what we did with American history and borrow tests and quizzes from um, borrow tests and quizzes from another book, which is much harder. We used master books, like I said, and tried to do tests and quizzes, but my daughter ended up needing to read the chapters because everything doesn't perfectly line up. Um, so there were certain ones where she did need to do the additional reading. Um, so while that can be a solution, it's probably the hardest solution of the solutions that I just listed. So most people will probably choose just to grade the projects and not worry about tests and quizzes. It is not mandatory that a class has tests and quizzes um, to, to be included in the assessment, but that is kind of an easy default way for parents to assess work uh, at the high school level. The other con is that some high schoolers will find it babyish. Um, particularly the audio files. So what can you do about that? Well, first of all, you could just choose something else if your high school student doesn't want to do it, or you could um, go ahead and dismiss them when you do the audio files, um, or you could let your high school student um, take the opportunity to be a leader in your family. You could let your high school student lead your other uh, children by reading the lesson, reading the read aloud, helping the younger kids with the game and things like that, um, and give them some leadership responsibilities. And that would probably be good for your high school student in a way to incorporate them in to what you're doing. Um, and then keeping in mind that the um, student explorer assignments for grades 10 and 12 are not babyish. And so they would definitely be doing their grade appropriate work there. Also, another thing that I wanted to mention about The Good and the Beautiful, after using it for high school, that I really have enjoyed is that they go back to original source documents frequently. So if we're going to learn about Thomas Jefferson, we're not going to learn what a historian thinks about Thomas Jefferson. We're going to go back and actually read his original writings and find out who he really was, not who um, you know, modern historians say that he was. So that is, that is something that Katie and I both really enjoyed because if you read an article about Thomas Jefferson and then you actually read his own writings, you find a great um, contradiction. So we found that very, very interesting to see how history has been tweaked and modified over the years based on who is writing the textbooks. So there's a great focus in return to the actual original documents within The Good and the Beautiful. And that is something that I found very valuable and honestly enlightening. Okay, so those are my thoughts and ideas on how you can use The Good and the Beautiful for your high school student. Um, let me know in the comments below if you have used The Good and the Beautiful for your high school student. And if so, what advice and ideas do you have? Um, for our viewers because I'm sure that you do have some good ideas and that um, other people would really love to hear them. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and I would be happy to answer those questions for you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time.